Well, you join us on a beautiful blue skied roasting hot July day down at Suffolk Water Park. We're on their magnificent trad lake. And uh, after doing a load of videos of me just sat in a chair waffling away, we thought, let's get out and do an in session film. Catch some fish, hopefully live for you guys to see. Um, and it started off quite nicely. So I had one about 17, 18 pounds about an hour ago, which I slipped back and then uh, reposition the rod and, uh, and, and got another bite quite quickly afterwards. So we're gonna try and get this guy in and then I'll show him to you. But today we're gonna to be looking at exactly what I'm doing. Simple, straightforward boilie fishing, bottom baits, simple rigs, knotless knots, nothing fancy, showing you that it's possible to catch carp from busy lakes using simple tactics and not loads of bait so you don't have to break the bank and it's just nice straightforward reliable solid tactics and if we get an opportunity we're also going to try a bit of surface fishing it looks bang on for it but there are swarms of seagulls in this area and uh, it may not be viable but um, that's the plan surface fishing if we can and hopefully a few bites on simple straightforward bottom bait tactics which i'll show you all about as we go through the day. In the meantime, got an absolutely stunning, heavily plated mirror on here. He's really hanging on. And hopefully we can get him in the net and I'll show him to you. Fantastic. So we've got a lovely fully scaled mirror in the net and uh, beautiful sort of low to mid double. Proper battle with him as well. So I've left him resting in the net partly because it's red hot and uh, I want him to get his breath back, which I might regret on the mat because it's post spawning and the fish are full of energy. But um, I've only got a day session today and it's always important to maximise those bite windows if you can. So the first thing I did after I got him in the net was plopped a few more boilies on the spot with a catapult. And um, then I've unhooked the fish, left him in the edge and re-wrapped the rod and put the, rod, the, the rig back onto the spot and um, set it. Because um, again, it's, bite windows can be narrow any time of year, but particularly now it's roasting red hot. So, the hotter it gets, the less chance I think we're going to have a, uh, of a bite on the bottom. So we're, uh, we're two, two fish to the good, probably in about an hour and a half fishing, I suppose, something like that. And um, there may be a chance of another one, but uh, we would never find out without having to rub back on the spot. So that's the priority. I'm going to set the alarm and the bobbin, and then we'll get the fish out and have a good look. Heavily plated mirrors don't come much better than that, do they? The amazing fish in the Trad Lake, probably topped off by this incredible looker. They're all lovely fish, but wow. So this guy came on a very, very simple, straightforward boilie fishing tactics, which I'm gonna show you. Uh, I didn't show you the hook hole, but it was nailed about an inch and a half back inside the mouth, which I'm sure you'll agree is quite a rare thing these days. And that's down to the fact that I'm fishing the way I am, which I'm going to show you all the technical elements. There aren't many of them, but that's why it's working. So thank you very much for coming to visit us on this day, mate. We was hoping to get one on a floater, but very happy to get one like you on the bottom. Lovely times. So the secret, in my opinion, to successful carp fishing on really pressure day ticket, club lakes, uh, in fact, it's something that I apply to pretty much all my carp fishing these days because I don't tend to fish the wild, unfished waters quite as much as I used to. Um, that's something I hope to rectify soon. But in the meantime, for fishing on really pressured lakes that see a lot of angler footfall, you need to, and I know I repeat myself, but you need to think outside the box and fish differently to other people if you want different results. If you fish the same as everyone else, you'll catch the same as everyone else. So. The main thing that I see with, uh, with carp angling these days is that it's very, very unnecessarily agricultural in terms of 
the end terminal setup. There's no finesse anymore. It's all great big size four hooks and uh, swivels and usually pop-ups, most of which are screaming, here I am, through some sort of visual and or chemical attraction. And my own fishing has been as far removed from that as, as possible for, for years now. But the fact that that is now over saturation time, over uh, that whole style of fishing, um, with, with rigid resetting booms and uh, it's, it's so overdone now that there is so much potential for fishing in a style of fishing that is completely separate from that and I mean soft supple booms, um, hook links. I mean who uses braid as a hook link these days? Hardly anybody. I, I use a soft coated braid and sometimes braid in itself a lot these days and um, the success that I had on my syndicate last year, which still astonishes me now, thinking back on it, was down to several factors. But one of them, I'm sure, was the fact that from the outset, I decided that I was going to go in with a braided hook link. No rigid resetting booms and uh, a smallish hook, just against the grain from everything that they're seeing. Now, that's a tough syndicate lake, and um, it worked very, very well. But I apply the same sort of thinking to my approach on busy busy day ticket lakes, club lakes and so on, because anywhere that sees, again, an oversaturation of a style of fishing, and in particular what I'm, the, the style of fishing that I'm talking about is the really bulky, over-cluttered, agricultural type of, of setup that you could use for sharks in the English Channel, you know, rather than carp in a, in a little English day ticket lake, you know, some of it is so overgun now and there's no doubt in my mind that fish find it very, very easy to sift and avoid and um, my, my sort of objective is to give them something that represents no danger, that is flexible, it's soft, it doesn't appear to be attached to anything, the hook is usually small and the bait itself is just a bottom bait. I mean, let's look at the bait first. So these are krill active baits and um, so I'm feeding these in the swim. Probably, and I know it does seem a bit strange to a lot of people, but usually the first thing I get is, oh great, yeah, so we're feeding this, what we're gonna put on hook? And that's the mindset I think people have got to get out of a bit. Put on the hook what they're bloody well eating, one of these. Don't think, oh, I'm gonna feed these, get them eating these lovely, incredible krill active boilies and then put something over the top which is totally different. It doesn't make any sense at all might have worked years ago and might work still a bit today but a lot of the time these tactics are working because of rather than, or working in spite of rather than because of so if you've got a lake where everybody is fishing a pink pop-up on a ronnie rig and there's six carp caught over a weekend and they're all on pink pop-ups on ronnie rigs then they would be because that's the only way people are fishing it doesn't mean that the most effective way of catching the carp at that particular place is by putting a pink pop-up on a ronnie rig um, and it's it's through sort of reading between the lines over the years that i sort of uh, found that i mean it, it, this goes back a long long way in my fishing but basically if you've got a brown boilie laying on the bottom the carp will eat it because it represents zero danger they never get caught on them so that's kind of uh, how I build my fishing approach in terms of rigs and baits for a lot of the time these days. I'm going to show you the rig that I'm using on this session, a rig that I use for an awful lot of my fishing. Now you might find it surprising that the only things I need for the rig are here. Some hook link and a hook. And when you think of the over complexity, I mean some of it is just incredible to my brain. Um, it's just, as I said earlier, overgunned and more suited to fishing for, for blue whales than it is for carp. Um, stripping it all back down, a really, really strong little hook. This is a little size eight. I mean, these aren't even Teflon coated, these hooks, they're so old fashioned. I don't think you can even get them anymore, but just a little strong size eight hook or size 10 hook. And um, I've sharpened this one just to, to make it really, really dangerous. And I've got some very, very soft coated braid i mean it, it it performs pretty much like braid but it's got just of enough enough of a coating on it to stop tangles uh, and to give me a bit of protection against anything that might be down there on the bottom but i do use braid quite a lot just straight normal braid 
Here I'm using um, just some coated braid. So on the end of this, I've just peeled off, I don't know, the last six inches of the coating to expose the soft braid. And I've put a little hair loop into the end like so. So now I've got just enough to tie a, a knotless knot. Remember those? So let's just cut that off there. And all I'm gonna do is pass that through and I'm going to tie a knotless knot so that I can present this 16mm uh, paste wrapped crew active bait next to the hook on the bottom and you know it almost looks like match fishing but this is how we used to fish for carp and it works really 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 well. Things have gone full circle you know if everyone started fishing like this for a few years then we might be back to trying to nail them on great big anchors but at the moment this is what's working really well simply because no one's doing it. So all I'm going to do is tie the knotless knot, I do two or three turns and then I lift the hair and then whip underneath it down the shank of the hook. It just causes the hair to stick out at a nice dangerous angle. And what I'm trying to do is use up enough of the uh, soft uncoated bit that I've stripped back until there's just a couple of mil left. So when I put it through and finish the knot there's a couple of mil of flexible there. So it doesn't have to be any set number of turns down the shank, but like I say, I'll do just enough to use up the, uh, the soft section. Um, now the next thing to do with the rig, actually that's it, there isn't anything else to do. That's it, a knotless knot on a bit of coated braid with a little sort of hinge joint just by there, just so the hook can move nicely and we're there. All I'm gonna do is tie a loop knot in the other end because I'm fishing a quick change system. So, I'm going to tie a figure of eight loop in the end of there and believe it or not the rig is finished. All I need to do is just tighten that down a bit. Let's just get myself a, something to pull against. I've lost all my tools. So let's just put that in there like that and while we've been doing this I've been looking out into the swim and I put some floaters out because this was uh, planned to be a floater fishing trip and um, although the seagulls are about a bit we've got the fish taking quite close in so we may be able to do some floater fishing today. That's it, that's the rig. Now to finish it off I do quite like just a little smidgen of, uh, of rig putty, just a little as the cool kids call it a mouse drop in halfway along the link so I'll just roll that and it just finishes it off keeps it nice and neat and flush to the bottom like so and you can see now where I've, I've whipped underneath the hair that it really kicks the hook out nicely and that's going to really really catch well in the mouth the fish won't even know it's in its mouth because the fish is looking for a massive great size four anchor and this is a tiny little eight well it's an old-fashioned eight this so it's more like a modern ten I should think won't even notice it's gone in its mouth until it's too late and what I'm going to do is get myself a bag, uh, a bait out of the bag. So this is just a, exactly the same as what I'm giving them. Pop that on the needle and put it on the hair. Again, fish aren't used to getting caught on baits that don't look dangerous. Fish are used to getting caught on baits that are the only one down there on the bottom of the lake that is shouting, here I am. And it doesn't take very long for the fish to realise that all of the baits that are not shouting, here I am, are perfectly safe. And they can eat them all day long with impunity. So here we have it. That lays on the bottom like that, supple hair, straight bait that they're eating, small hook, and that's what I've had the, uh, the couple of fish on that I've caught this morning. It's out there on both rods, hoping to get another one. But it couldn't be, as I'm sure you'll agree, more simple than that. It's a hook link and a hook. Put that where you see the fish and you should be able to catch them. Now, baiting up is always something that needs to be discussed. Um, I've got a, a decent sized bag of boilies with me today, but that's just what I grabbed out of the freezer. I'm certainly not intending to use anywhere near that amount of bait. What I am doing is drip feeding the swim by catapult with straight boilies every now and again. So there's no spom, there's no wrapping sticks. Um, in fact, 
that's not quite true. One of the rods I'm fishing is, is to, to a bit of an overhang that I need to me measure to the clip. So I'm using wrapping sticks for that, but I'm not really fishing a spot. I'm not baiting really heavily, um, spawning, the granny, spawning the proverbial granny out of it. I'm just catapulting in some boilies. The rig goes in with a nice little plop, two ounce lead. That's in a few boilies over the top. Now, to get a bite on lakes like this, if you put out 10 baits, more than enough to get a reaction, especially when you're fishing a, a potent bait which is breaking down nicely on the bottom and giving out loads of attraction like that. But even if you weren't, you know, whatever company's bait that you decide to use, you don't need loads and loads. A lot of the mindset these days and has been for a long time is that the more bait you put in, the more fish you're going to catch. And it's a major handicap. Fish for a bite, and some people have asked me what I mean by that because we're always trying to fish for a bite, but what I mean is fish for a bite. Just fish for one fish at a time. Don't turn up gung-ho and think, right, I'm going to empty the lake, I'm going to put out this bucket of mix and it's all laden with these additives that the chemical companies uh, tell me is the best thing to bring the carp into the swim. You know, if you're not on the fish, then there isn't really anything that's going to bring the fish like iron filings to a magnet from 200 yards away. You need to get yourself ideally in a situation where you're near fish. But when you're in that situation, just fish for a bite. Put a rig down, nice and simple like I've showed you, and put half a dozen boilies. You know, you don't need, you know, half, six baits with a catapult on top of the rig. It can be very, very cheap, effective fishing. And when you've caught a fish, put in a few more. Maybe when you're waiting for a bite, sometimes I'll plop out a bait or two every 10 minutes. You know, nobody drip feeds their swim with bait, match angler style. And it's a tactic that I've used a lot down the years with boilies. Very, very effective. Fish never um, treat a boilie plopping into the water with any kind of danger. They just treat it with curiosity. So if you just continually or periodically pulting out the odd boilie or two, any fish that are in the area just swimming past, if that plops next to them, they will go down for a look for it nine times out of 10 because they won't treat it with any danger or suspicion at all. Um, and that kind of, you know, little and often baiting is something that no one does anymore. And again, is a very, very effective tactic. So that's what we're doing today. Straightforward boily fishing. It's um, getting towards the end of July. It's red hot, the fish have spawned. You know, some people might be on particle and I've seen a lot of spawning and stuff going on today, but We've proved that just the simple approach with boilies can be effective even in the height of summer like this. The fish have spawned, they are hungry. We've had a few taking floaters. What I'm going to do, I've been looking out the corner of my eye while I've been talking to you guys and seeing a few slurps down, uh, slurping down the floaters. So I'm going to set up a rod and we'll look at how I go about that as well. In the meantime, we've got a couple of rods on the deck. We've caught two fish. With the rest of the afternoon still ahead, I'm confident we might nick one more. So, fingers crossed, we're keeping it simple and proving that it works. That is why you always recast if you think you should have had a bite and you haven't, redo the rod. Well, there you go, a lovely double figure, fully scaled mirror carp, absolute perfection, gorgeous looking fish. And as I said, the result of putting the rig back in place may have been laying across a twig, something was clearly not right. And uh, that really is one of the best bits of advice I've ever been given. So. So you only take one thing from this film, take that. Uh, we've been feeding the swim with floaters throughout and uh, the seagulls have been a pain, but the fish have been half interested. So we're gonna get this fella back in the lake and we're gonna look at that next. The first thing with floater fishing is that it's always best to have a dedicated setup if you can. Trying to hash together something from your usual carp gear to take advantage of an opportunity when it arises means that more often than not, you're gonna have a very frustrating time casting out floats or even free lining with your 15 pound mono or God forbid fluorocarbon on a three and a half pound test curve rod with a big pit reel. You know, it's, uh, it's never really the greatest recipe for success. So 
I always have carried a dedicated floater set up and I carry that from March, 1st of March, all the way through to the 31st of October. Sometimes beyond if the weather um, dictates that uh, possibilities may arise, but you will find that the back end of autumn, um, or not the back end, the back end of summer I should say, when autumn is in the air and it's in October and you've had some cold nights, the fish really will seek out those warm little sheltered bays, a few leaves lying on the surface. If they can get in the sun, away from the wind, they real, really will seek out the warmth at that time of year, just like they do in the spring. So for me, floater fishing is just as uh, appropriate at the back end of the summer and into the autumn as it is early on. Again, early on in the year, I'm doing this a bit back to front, but if we rewind back to the start of the year in the springtime, the very first few days that the fish venture onto the surface are often the best times to get them on a floater because they haven't been pressured on, on surface tactics at all. They're a little bit more naive and easier to slip up, slip up and they're uh, quite often a bit more gung-ho. So I have caught them in February actually on floaters. So if uh, the general, general rule of thumb is, uh, is from the 1st of March, but um, always be aware, you know, I mean, people catch fish on zigs in the upper layers all the way through the winter. And I know some anglers have caught big carp from places uh, like Elstow in, in the middle of winter. So there's always a chance, but generally March to October for me. So the gear that I carry, I've got a JRC Cocoon 2G rod, which is a dedicated floater rod. It's a 12 foot, two and a half pound test curve. It's got lovely uh, minima rings, it's very lightweight, full length cork handle, nice and traditional. It's even got a keeper ring on here for uh, hooking your, your hook on. You obviously got a long hook link and a float on normally, so that's quite handy. But the key is that the rod is responsive, light in the hand, because unlike carp rods, which you put down on a bite alarm, you're holding this all the time. So it's light, responsive, it's got a lovely progressive action, you know, a two and a half pound test curve. So it's an absolute joy to play fish on, but it's got enough backbone if you're fishing in weedy waters and you need to give the fish a bit of stick. So I've twinned that or paired it with a pen rival. These are gorgeous little reels. I've been using these for 18 months or so now. Beautiful little intermediate pit reel. So, you know, even if I get a lot of people messaging me asking uh, about a reel they could put on their 10 foot rods or their light 12 foot rods. Um, if you're fishing a lake that isn't big and you don't need to be doing cast, really long casts, then in fact, even if you were doing long casts, I mean, this spool with the, the uh, slow oscillation and the perfect line lay, you could cast 100 yards with one of these easily. So lovely, funky look, looking reel, really good slick clutches. And as I say, it's got this perfect line lay, which really helps with the braid that I use. So um, braid is something I've used for surface fishing. Well, I haven't stretched my mind back now, uh, late nineties. So we found that when we were going through our sort of learning curve of floater fishing with small floating pellets at linear in about 97, 98. When the fishing eventually got a bit harder, we found that we could hook so many more fish on braid. Because if you think about it, it's a reflex action. You know, you've got the fish, they come up and, and how many times have we all struck? Nothing, strike, nothing. Oh, it's just mouthed it, oh, I missed it. With braid, you miss a lot less because you're straight through connected to that float uh, and, the, and the hook bait virtually instantaneously, which with mono, obviously there's a lot more um, give and, and it's a bit of a delayed reaction, delayed response. So braid is always my first choice for floater fishing, not only for the reasons that I just stated, but also almost as valuable, valuably is that it allows you to mend the line. And by that, I mean, if you've got a bow in your line, you don't want a bow in your line when you're floater fishing because when you do get a bite, all of the strike action is transferred to the bow rather than to the float. So it's important to try and maintain a straight line from the tip of the rod out to the float. In crosswinds, it's very difficult. So I always try and get with the wind over my back if I can, drift bait out to the fish. But keeping a line straight to the float is very important. Braid will allow you to do that much more easily than mono because when you do mend the line and take the bow out of it, the float will not move as much as it does with the drag of mono. The braid is floating, so it lifts off the surface really easily and crisply and gives you that direct instant response. This is Berkeley Whiplash, 
which is in a diameter of 0 0.10. Uh, ignore the pound braking strains because they're massive, but um, uh, 0 0.10 or 0 0.8 are absolutely perfect for floater fishing. So that's the, uh, the rod, reel and braid combination. We'll have a look at the, uh, the, side, uh, the other side of the float, I should say, next. So the type of uh, floater controller that you use is personal preference, really. I really like these um, bubble float style inline controllers come in a variety of sizes and you just fill them with the amount of water that you need to make the distance. They don't bother the carp, they go in nice and quiet and they cast a long way. Hook link material, you would really struggle to find anything better than um, Trilene XL, Berkeley Trilene XL. Been using this, again, probably 25 years. It is absolutely bulletproof. Very, very hard to detect in the water doesn't seem to tangle much it just ticks every single box it's clear and uh, very very soft and yet very very tough it, I think this is one of the greatest monos ever created but um, as I said I've been using it for so many you know, a, a couple a couple of decades or more fish just boshed out in my swim over the right hand rod you might have heard that um, come on the right hand rod um, so this is this is really good gear for hook links now I mentioned earlier that I've got braid on my pen rival reel Braid is my preference, but if you didn't want to use braid, or perhaps if you weren't allowed to because of local rules, if you want a mainline that's going to be really good for, fl for floater fishing, this is perfect for your mainline or your hook link. It floats as well without treatment, so it stays on the top where you, where you need it. I carry this in a variety of different diameters, so I've got it as high as 2.5, 2.8, um, which are sort of 10, 10 pound sort of hook links. I've got some 12 pound as well and I'll carry it down as low as 0 0.16, which is probably about six pound, which is what I'm gonna try and get a bite on today because the fish are quite finicky. But a range of diameters to suit different situations uh, is very, very pr prudent to carry. Small lightweight hooks, um, I carry them in, um, again, I mean, it's your choice really, but size is important. Um, 10s and 12s are the mainstay, occasionally an eight, but usually a 10 or a 12 and you will find that the smaller you go, the more bites you tend to get. Lastly, hook baits. Um, I favour a trim down pop-up, which I'll show you shortly, um, but these guys, uh, they're about 11 mil in size. I carry them in a few different colours and I trim them down to suit. And I find that a visual hook bait is an absolute um, necessity, really. If you wait for a fish to bolt against the float, then on a lot of lakes you could be waiting till you go home. And the ability to strike when the fish takes your hook bait is an absolute key part of the successful floater fishing process. So a hook bait that I can see is imperative. So I usually I'll, I'll carry creams, beiges, um, these are sort of dark orange as you can see, and even in certain light conditions, these black ones, absolutely brilliant. But the key is that you must be able to see your hook bait because as soon as that hook bait disappears and you can no longer see it, that's the second that you have to strike. If you don't, then the fish will invariably spit it back out and you've missed your chance. So I always use a, a bait that can be seen easily. I've used bright yellow, pinks, whites, they all work um, and they all have their day. And don't worry about bright ones on the surface, you know. It's, um, at, at, on one side it's kind of it's silhouetted so you know there isn't much color to it but at the same time the color is discernible to the fish because there's been a lot of so many occasions i can think of down the years where i've had a fish on pink and then i've gone straight back out with the pink cannot get a bite at all and then you think right i'll change you bring it in you change it to white or yellow put it out you get a bite straight away and you put it back out you can't get a bite and you have to change it again so the fish are very aware and very responsive to colour, but again, the bottom line is that you must be able to see your hook bait if you want to be successful at floater fishing. So, they're the key things. Um, I'm going to tie up a hook link. Let's just mention, we mentioned the hook link material. Actually, before I get onto the hook link material, I should just uh, mention my method of, of attachment, which again is critical. I've gone through all different styles of hook bait attachment down the years tiny little hairs, bands and stuff like that. But what I tend to do these days is just side hook. So I take, take my little size 10, I pass it through the boilie and around 
onto the shank like that. Could not be simpler. Um, with these baits, it doesn't slide down the shank, it stays in position. These are called proper jobs and uh, they're really, really good. It just stays where it needs to be. Once I've got it in that position, I tend to trim the sides and the top off a bit and make it look a bit, little bit sort of uh, roughened around the edges, but um, that's it. Um, and that's tied with the grinner knot to the end of the hook link. Now the hook link length is very, very, very important indeed. You want really the longest hook link that you can cast. The more separation between the float and the hook bait, the It might be a bream. I think it is a bream. <sighs> Fantastic. I love bream. Made my day. So much better than carp. Right. Um, hook bait separation. Yeah, so the float, the bigger the distance between your float and the hook bait, the more bites you will get. So if you can, I mean, my general rule of thumb is I never go below six foot and quite often find that sort of seven, eight foot is, is about where I need to be. So standard carp fishing casting rules apply, same as with a zig or anything else, you stop it before it hits the water to throw the hook link away to prevent tangles. But again, with this inline setup, tangles are very, very rare, even at long range. So that's the, uh, the technical side of things. I'll show you the combination of baits that I like to use on the surface next. The type of bait that we use when we float a fish is very, very important. And if you're still trapped in the days of good old chum mixers, then you'll catch fish, but you'll never catch as many as if you're using a nice fishy dedicated pellet. I use krill floaters. Uh, these guys are the big ones in 11 mil. Now the 11 millers are an essential part of the approach, but the real weapon is the krill six mil floaters, which are absolutely essential to provoke the required response from, from the carp. Now, if you just bait a swim with large size floating pellets like those or like chum mixers, then you'll get a response, but it will never ever be on the scale of the response that you can get from feeding small quantities, or sorry, big quantities of small pellets. Now, I've coated these in oil, um, hemp oil, cap oil is my favorite, which is a nice spicy fish oil. You could even use sunflower oil, um, but I like to coat them in an oil for obvious reasons. What, the first is that it's, it's very attractive to the fish. Second is that it does flatten off the ripple and give you a nice attractive slick, which enables you to see exactly what's going on with your hook bait and how your tackle is lying. I like to feed these at a ratio of about 70-30, so 70% of the small ones, 30% of the big ones. If you just feed the tiniest ones, you can find it very difficult to get a bite on a hook bait when you put your rig in. So it's essential to have a percentage of the larger ones in the mix. In terms of getting them out there, I mean, obviously if it's close range, catapult, but one thing that I have found over the years is that the further out that the fish are taking floaters, the easier they are to hook. They feel a lot safer um, feeding away from the bank and that's where a spawn comes into its own long range controllers you know the large size um, inline bubble floats and um, and baiting up with the spawn that is one of the most game changing styles of floater fishing that I've seen uh, I've been using it for about 10 well over 10 years now and the days of putting out a little dainty controller in close and firing five or six baits around it and catching a carp are not gone but i very rarely fish like that simply because getting fish feeding a bit further out on a, on a variety of, of tiny tiny little floating pellets with a few bigger ones not only gets them feeding more confidently because they don't sense the danger they're away from the bank but it invites more fish to the party you're you're fishing for a shoal or a pack of a fish a pack of fish rather than just that one fish that you've targeted with a in the old-fashioned days you know when we just put out as i said a little controller a little skittle fire a couple of baits around it and try and catch a carp. Now when it's floater fishing, I'm usually trying to get several fish feeding at a time before I'd even put a float in. And more often than not, you'll find that once you've got them to that stage of interest and, and um, they are greedy enough to be slurping down the floaters, competing with each other, if you catch one at that stage, then when you get the guy in the net, you look up, all the others are still feeding. The first thing to do, put out another spawn or two of bait. I've used this on rock hard syndicates all over the place and 
when you get them going on the floaters, they do not bat an eyelid. I've had them eating out in really hard places, eating out of the spawn virtually, you know, within seconds of it landing. So it's not the sort of uh, under the radar stealthy floater fishing of old, but it's a new modern approach, um, big bubbles, uh, big bubble floats and visible hook baits, braided main lines and putting out lots of pellets at range is really the name of the game on a lot of waters now and it can be so effective. The thing that precludes it obviously is bird life. Bird life is a major problem on a lot of lakes now and if it's not ducks and geese it's always the, the seagulls which seem to be everywhere now. Today has been a bit different. Normally I carry, I, well I always carry plenty of baits. I, I usually carry a few boxes of cheap stuff that I just get from the co-op, cheap floating dog biscuits and I'll put those in a part of the lake for the swans and the mallards and, and the seagulls to feast on. Here today in Suffolk, we've been faced with a bit of an unusual phenomena in so far as yesterday, uh, if, in fact, my wife and I were filming it on our phones. We had just, just less than half a mile from here, literally thousands of seagulls. And um, Luke, Luke said maybe they were feeding on a flying ant hatch or something, which is quite possible. But whatever the phenomena was going on, there were thousands of seagulls. The sky was white with them. It was like something out of a Hitchcock movie. I'd never seen anything like it in my life, and that was here. Um, so I was a little bit worried about it today. It was almost like they all came out because they knew I was doing a floater fishing video. So normally I would try and feed the gulls off, but I know how many are in the area. There's been a few coming around all day long today, and I've been very wary of my usual approach, which is put in lots of bait, feed the seagulls off, and then crack on because there are that many around, I'm not sure I could feed them off. So I don't know what's going on, but right now, Suffolk, probably all the seagulls in the southeast of England are right here. So probably wherever you're floater fishing, you're having a nice time of it. Generally speaking, don't be afraid of, of them, whatever the birds are. You know, for five quid, you can get yourself all the biscuit and a few loaves of white breast bread. They're like 20p for a loaf of bread, you know, in a co-op or something. Throw the bread in for the swans, just feed the birds off. It doesn't take much money and it doesn't take much time and then you can crack on with floater fishing and enjoy the real pleasure that it has to offer. You know, one of the greatest things in carp fishing is seeing carp taking on the surface and then hooking one on that light rod and you do that strike and it just hits that resistance and folds over and the clutch starts ticking. I mean, it's one of the, the most sublimely beautiful ways to catch carp. It's how I caught my first ever carp and uh, I hope it's how I catch my last. We're gonna have a go today I'm going to put out a few more baits. Um, it may be um, that I'll just put out a single where the fish are cruising out in the middle. It's a difficult day despite the heat and the apparent seemingly good conditions for a surface bait. There's not that many fish to be seen, but I've shown you basically what I do, how I go about it. I've been doing it for three, three or more decades now, surface fishing. So I've sort of honed it down to a few key basic details which I've tried to get across to you guys so hopefully it'll help you in your float efficient exploits. We're going to carry on trying to get a, a carp off the bottom you know I think maybe there's a 20 pounder out there with my name on it so we've got a few hours still to go it's all to play for let's get a single floater out there in the middle and see what, what happens. One of the most basic rules of carp fishing is if you're sat in a swim with no fish in it don't stay there so there's very very few fish cruising on the surface where I'm sat and given the incredible weather and the number of fish that are in the lake I expect to see a lot of fish on the surface so I went for a look up the other end thinking that somewhere there must be a mother load of them and sure enough they're all sat up the other end where there's no angling pressure so I've grabbed the, the basic essentials I'm going to nip up there and see if we can get one to take a floater. the dance floor. Oh, f motherless. F oh, did you see that? <laughs> that was unmissable and I missed it. <laughs> did you see that? I f waited and then it went. I didn't strike too early and I still f missed it. Sometimes it's just the hook bait, right? Oh no. <laughs> Well, it's 
been an immensely frustrating afternoon, most of which has been my own fault, I have to say. We came down the other end of the lake with just a rod and a net and I didn't have all my bits and pieces. I only had two choices of hook bait and I kept thinking after missing a couple of bites and feeling that I really should have got one, I kept thinking, should I just run back up the other end and get my other ones and didn't and you put it out again and you just hope that Anyway, eventually I did go and get them and uh, put one out and hooked one, which you just saw, which I just had a hook pull on and lost, and then put it back out and hooked another one straight away. So it proves two things. Having a choice of hook baits is very, very important and never giving up is even more important. I'm done in now. Me and Luke have been out in this baking sun all day and um, it's been a hard one battle this but if we get this guy in the net and we've had him off the top and off the bottom quite a few bites in a short little day which i'm very pleased about let's just see if we can get this guy in he's not big but he's very pretty by the looks of things oh yeah <laughs> what a day that's a lot of fun well, there's the fella that we nailed on the floater. Real last gasp cast it was too. Luke had to go, I had to go, it was the end of the day. And then we lost one. <laughs> I thought, I can't believe this is just hell. And then very next cast, managed to hook this fella. What a beautiful, fully scaled mirror to finish the session off with. Had some lovely looking fish today. Off the top, off the bottom on simple boily tactics. Hope you picked up a few things that you can put into your own angling from this and uh, as always thanks very much for joining us.